There is nothing more boring than a 3D printer without lights. Okay, I might be exaggerating a little bit there, but it's certainly a pretty good way to add a bit of style. And I guess it doesn't have to be purely for aesthetics either. Some functional lighting could help you, you know, see what's printing, could help your camera take better pictures, and even let you know what's going on at a glance with like print progress and temperatures. So whether you want your printer to look more like this, or maybe something a little bit more sophisticated, today I'm going to show you how you can use both white and RGB lighting to easily upgrade your 3D printer to make it as beautiful and functional as you've always dreamed. PCBWay is an all-in-one manufacturer and assembly service for PCBs, but now they also do CNC machining, injection moulding, sheet metal fabrication and 3D printing. It's really easy to use, you can just upload your files and you'll get an instant quote and automated design for manufacturer feedback to help you just in case you need to improve your design a little bit. They also sponsor educational and engineering programs, so to try out PCBWay's easy ordering service, Follow the link in the video description to pcbway.com. This guide is going to be mainly based on Clipper when it comes to precise firmware configuration, but there will still be quite a bit of useful information for other firmware options too. And you never know, this might give you the incentive you need to upgrade your 3D printer to Clipper firmware. So if you want a guide on doing that, let me know in the comments section down below. As we go through this guide, we'll get more complex and advanced as we go. So if you just want the basics, that's fine. But if you want the really juicy, super cool, flashing lights, rainbows everywhere, I'd recommend watching to the very end. Obviously, we're using LEDs here. And in terms of available strips, there are generally three types. White LEDs are single emitter LEDs. You apply voltage and they turn on. The second type are addressable digital RGBs, for example, a brand name would be Neopixels. If you apply voltage, they don't actually just turn on. You have to send a signal to them. So for this, instead of just the normal positive and ground pins, you also have an additional data pin. So three pins in total. The final type of LED strip is a four pin RGB. Four pin RGB is basically analog RGB, which has quite a big downside for the more advanced flashy applications in that they're not individually addressable. The other thing I need to mention is PWM. Since LEDs need a certain voltage to operate, we can't really adjust that very much to control their brightness. Instead, we flash them on and off pretty fast, and our persistence of vision smooths this out to form a uniform brightness. And this is kind of what we call PWM. The cycle time, or time period, is the length of one full flashing cycle, e.g. the time it's off plus the time it's on. So if it's on for 0.6 seconds and off for 0.4 seconds, that's a time period or cycle time of one second. The duty cycle is the percentage of time that it spends on and is roughly equivalent to brightness. So for the same example above, our LED was on for 0.6 seconds out of the full one second cycle time. So the duty cycle is 60%. It's about 60% brightness. One common effect you'll see when setting up LEDs is that fast motion can look kind of stuttery. So like waving your hand within the light will kind of show this particularly well. And it looks like it's like in a few places, but not smoothly moving as your hand normally does. This is because the cycle time is too long. You need to make the cycle time fast, so it's flashing very quickly. And so your hand is kind of captured by your eyes in more positions than it would otherwise be. It's a bit like refresh rate on a television or monitor. Faster refresh rate gives smoother motion. Now that we've got that out of the way, this is how to wire things up and what considerations to make. The locations I recommend for connecting your LEDs are firstly any dedicated connection points. Typically these are for near pixels, but in the future you may find them for other LEDs too. And then spare heater connections and then fan headers. Control boards may have different current ratings for these connections as it will depend on the schematic design by the designer as well as the physical connector being used, so be sure to check what your control board is capable of. LEDs, especially if using quite a few of them, or if set particularly bright, can draw quite a lot of power, not like huge amounts, but a fair bit. For example, five of my daybreak LEDs at 100% duty cycle 
would consume somewhere around 25 watts. So at 24 volts, this is just over one amp of current. I don't actually recommend running the 100% by the way, it's just an example. The fan headers on the BigTreeTech Octopus are rated for one amp of current, so wouldn't strictly be suitable for this particular application. Fan and near pixel headers typically use JST XH connectors and heaters typically use screw terminals which need bootlace ferrules. Now that you know all the fundamentals, we can get going with some more fancy lighting options. Since we've already covered how and where to plug in LEDs in the previous section, we now need to focus on how to get them best configured in the firmware. I'm going to use my Daybreak LEDs as an example. We have two options for Clipper firmware configuration, a generic output pin command or an LED command. I generally used output pin until recently, but LED gets more LED specific support via other parts of Clipper, such as the web interface, which we'll look at later on. The code in our implementation for output pin in the firmware would look like this. For configuration using the LED section, it would look something a little bit like this. Once we do a save and restart, so the new firmware configuration is actually used by the printer, we see some change in the web interface. In this case, we're using mainsail. If we use LED, we get this simple control to modify the brightness and turn on and off our LEDs from the interface. The more generic implementation gets a similar but more generic non-light specific control. Now that you have them set up and working, you might want some additional control via G-code. If you wanted to, it would look something like this. Sync is used to synchronize with ongoing G-code commands, but use zero if precise timing is not needed, and then this will prevent resetting the idle timeout as well. Transmit is whether to send the command or not. So if set to zero, the LED will be changed with the next set LED command that uses transmit equals one. This is useful for if you want to set a bunch of individual LEDs, but all at the same time. You can like set them up using transmit zero, and then the last one, transmit one, it'll change all of them at the same time. In addition to this, you could actually make a macro for each of your specific lighting, lighting commands to make it a little bit easier to implement into your like start end macros or something like that. These can be saved in your printer.cfg configuration file. With these created, you simply need to add case light underscore on, case light underscore off, or case light underscore standby to your macros. Pretty easy, happy days. So for basic setup, such as enclosure lighting, this is looking all pretty good. We have the white lights with some basic control, but we can do more, a lot more. So let's get the party started with some RGB. When wiring up NearPixel, bear in mind that these are powered by five volts and not 24 volts, so the current will be higher. For the RGB LEDs on Daybreak Neo, they draw about 33 milliamps per LED package when all colors are at maximum brightness. So this is about 0.45 amps per strip at maximum brightness. Near pixel connectors are typically JSTXH, but they don't all follow the same wiring scheme, so double check the pinout before you plug them in. With the wiring sorted, let's move on to firmware configuration. Fortunately for us, implementing RGB in Clipper is pretty easy to do with the NeoPixel section. I think this is all quite self-explanatory, apart from maybe the color order. So this is the order in which the integrated circuit on each like chip package reads the colors. So most NeoPixel LEDs are GRB, so start with this if you're not sure. If you have RGBW LEDs, so you've got that additional white section, then you'll also need to make sure that that's in the correct order. W is typically last. With the configuration sorted, save and restart, and you should find your RGBs are now showing a nice splash of color. Like with the single color lights, the web interface main cell will show you a small control box where you can make adjustments. We can also send G-code commands to control them. Since these are now addressable, we can even set each LED color individually using the index command and use transmit to change all of them at once. As before, save these into your printer.cfg or create a standalone LED configuration file and use the include section to include it in your firmware configuration, much like you might have done for like the mainsail.cfg. To make it easier for you, here are some example colors that you might find useful. To change the brightness, just multiply all of the numbers in the palette by the same decimal. So maybe like 0.5 for half the brightness. 
Now that we've added a good splash of RGB to the printer, we can crank it up to another level because these lights don't have to be fixed colors. We can use the print parameters like temperature and print progress to determine the color. So let me show you how. In this segment, we're going to implement a function in Clever called display underscore templates, which allows us to control LEDs based on the printer's current state, like temperature or print progress. So we have our near pixels set up just as we did before, and now we need a display template. Now, all of this is really doing is creating an RGB color output, but because we're doing some calculations, the output will change like each time it gets reviewed. We start by naming the display template in the section header, then we start the text field, which is needed for the output. Then we calculate the ratio using the current temperature and the extruder max temperature. Lastly, we use the ratio value to change between solid red and solid blue. Now we have the color changing, we need to apply this color changing to a selection of our LEDs. As we're applying a display template and not a fixed color, we need to use the set LED template command instead of the set LED command. Optionally, you can add an index, and this is the number of the LED on the chain the template is applied to. To send this command to the printer, you can just type it into the console and hit send. But that's not very practical for anything other than testing, so you guessed it, it's time for another macro. I could write a bunch of these myself and share them, but why reinvent the wheel? So instead, I'm going to borrow from GitHub user Digital Ninja RO and their Clipper NearPixel templates and I'll show you how to implement these instead. And that will all be linked below, of course. To use this, you just need to upload the CFG file to your printer and include it in the printer.cfg. Once you've restarted the printer, you'll find a new macro called NeoPixel Display, which is gonna do basically all the small things in two different modes. Glow, which changes from one color to another as say temperature increases, or progress mode, which changes from one LED at one end of the strip to all of the LEDs filling the strip, depending on something like a progress of the print. LED is the name of the LED strip. Type is the bed temperature, hot end temperature, print progress or print speed. Mode is either glow or progress. This will then change the LED from blue to red as it reaches the target temperature. Placing this in your start macro for the heating progress, then another version for maybe progress when the print starts, will get some pretty good indicators of printing status, such that one strip can be enough to do the bed, the hot end, and the print progress. When you don't want an effect, you can still revert to other commands to set solid colors or turn them off. But what if you want more, even more? Yep, yeah, well, there is one more tier of magic rainbow awesomeness, so let me show you the way. As you might have noticed, if you've been using display templates, they do have a limitation, and that's that their refresh rate is maybe around like two times a second. So if we're going to improve on that, we need something that can interact faster. What we're going to use is a kind of plugin for Clipper called LED Effects. This was started by Paul McGowan, also known as Mental on Discord, and is now maintained by Hagbart. If you do go ahead and use this, be kind, it's not fully complete yet, and the documentation is kind of incomplete too. But let me show you how cool it is, and maybe you can give it a go and provide some feedback. Installation is pretty easy using the install script, just ssh to the pi using putty or command line, and then paste the code into the terminal and hit enter. To set up the effects, configure your near pixels basically the same as before with a pin and a chain count, and then go absolute ham with the LED effects command. To do this, we implement the section and give it a name for the effect. Then add the LEDs section to it and define which LEDs you want to use the effect. We can specify an entire strip here or an index range. So if we want to use part of a strip for one of the effects and maybe a part of the strip for something else, you can do that. Then we specify layers. These are the actual effects that are being used. The formatting is important here. First is the layer name, then the effect rate then cutoff, then blending method, and finally, the color palette. Color palette may be single or multiple colors depending on the effect that you're using. Multiple layers can be added, subtracted, multiplied, etc., similar to image editing software. And then we can add things like auto start to start when the printer does, run on error to run when there's an error, and frame rate to set the frame rate of the effect. 
If the effect you want to use runs when the printer starts and stays like that the whole time, then enable auto start and you really don't need to worry about anything more. However, as before, you'll want probably G-code or commands and macros to change these effects to something appropriate, depending on the status of the printer at any given time. The effect is just the name of the LED effect that you want to enable. Optionally, you can add stop equals one if you want to turn the effect off rather than on. And optionally, you can add a fade time. And then here's a quick demo of some of the effects you can use to combine into other things. You've got linear fade, breathing, blink, strobe, twinkle, gradient, comet, chase, fire, and step. There are loads of effects that you can try out and there are loads of interesting ways you can combine them and layer them. So give it a go and be sure to share what you come up with in the Vector3D Discord channel. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to find more about Daybreak LEDs and RGB stuff for 3D printers in the description below. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.